You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. Today on From Embers, I talked to three organizers involved with Alliance Against Displacement about a schoolhouse building that people squatted in Nanaimo territory, where the city of Nanaimo, BC is situated, as well as tent cities occupied by homeless, indigenous, and working-class people in Coast Salish territories, where Vancouver and the Lower Mainland are situated. The territory known as British Columbia has a particular relationship to the Canadian state, in that indigenous people never surrendered their lands. Canada's tenuous claim to those territories, and the long history of people contesting those claims, makes for some pretty conflictual relations between homeless people trying to claim urban spaces for shelter, safety, and community, and the police, social workers, and white supremacists engaged in active programs of displacement and social death. The stories you'll hear today aren't about anarchism specifically, but they touch on some themes that I think are relevant and interesting for anarchists and anyone else interested in confronting capitalism and colonial domination on this land base that the Canadian state currently seeks to control. And with that, I'll let the folks I interviewed speak for themselves. Uh, My name is Listen, and I've been organizing with AAD for actually just about a year now. Um, So uh, the Alliance Against Displacement has existed in kind of different forms for about five years. Um, In our current iteration, we run campaigns in a number of towns and cities within the Lower Mainland here in BC. So there's the Anita Place Tent City in Maple Ridge, which is the campaign that I'm most involved in. But we also uh, support and organize in Nanaimo with Discontent Tent City, uh, Saanich with Namigan's Tent City, Surrey, um, Burnaby with Low Income Tenants, Um, and on and off in Vancouver. So we're a multi-regional anti-capitalist and anti-colonial political group. Um, And I'd say that right now we've recently shifted from focusing mostly on campaign work and community support into um, being more of a political organization and really concretizing and bringing out revolutionary political articulations out of these um, campaign bases that we work in. Can you go into a bit more detail about that or tell me about the politics of AAD in that respect? I'm both curious, like, how you think of yourselves politically as an organization, um, but also how you think about the relationship with homeless people and Indigenous and working class people that you're organizing with. Full disclosure, there are a couple communists in the group, and I'd say that there's definitely... um... Uh, Marxism and material, um, historical materialism is a strong influence on how we theorize our work, uh, but we are definitely committed to um, non-sectarian politics. Um, so in terms of the composition of the group, I'd say it's a mix of people who would probably, if pressed, describe themselves as communists, people who describe themselves as indigenous sovereigntists, and then a kind of um, group of people who are maybe newer to uh, organizing and um, wouldn't necessarily gravitate to labels like anarchist, communist, and that sort of thing. Um, In terms of how we articulate our politics, we focus on working class people and indigenous people, and we see homeless people as definitely part of the working class. Um, So, you know, we're like not into this language of lumpen proletariat that 
um, fixates on, you know, industrial workers as uh, the most revolutionary social group um, in capitalist or colonial societies. So when we talk about our social bases and our politics, we talk about working class people, some of whom are homeless and indigenous people who we don't, um, we, we conceive of as having a distinct um, social identity that's separate from working class people because of the legacy of settler colonialism on Turtle Island and the ways in which indigenous peoples have been um, treated as barriers to capitalist production rather than folded into the working class. Um, so when it comes to what exactly we're doing, um, the we've got like a number of different focuses. And I think when it comes to homeless people, the politics that are brought to the forefront are fighting for autonomous dual power outside of property relations. So tent cities are sites where we can build this power to occupy um, publicly owned land and to relate to it um, with use rather than ownership. And so for us, that's both an anti-capitalist and an anti-colonial intervention in Canada because of the way that public, private, and crown property are um, form this kind of shared pillar of both colonialism and capitalism. I'm curious about how you see your group enacting anti-colonial politics um, in general. And also, I guess, I read your opening statement for the schoolhouse squat um, acknowledging that the squat is on the territory of the Snanaimuk Nation. Um, mm -hmm. And you say that the schoolhouse squad is not making a claim to title or ownership of the lands under the Rutherford School, but rather pledging to use the building and lands in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, can you expand on that a bit or talk about how you um, think about reconciling squatting as a strategy in a context where um, a lot of the land theft and dispossession that has gone on has been through I guess legal squatting, I would say, um, right. by like white or European settlers. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the emphasis is on land relations rather than property rights, because the way in which um, Canada has dispossessed Indigenous people is by parceling out Indigenous territory as the property of the Crown or the property of, you know, municipalities or provinces or um, private individuals. So, and I think the the kind of disproportionate police repression and also the hysteria over the damage, the uh, supposed damage to the school kind of demonstrates the ways in which um, property is at the crux of um, both capital and colony. And in terms of relationships to host nations, that's, um, that's been complicated and can often be tense because most of the indigenous people in tent cities and who are organizing with us are urban indigenous people who are not only dispossessed from um, their territories, but often don't even know what nations they're a part of or for whatever reason um, can't go back to those nations and will likely live the greater part of their lives outside of their home territories. And so Another part of AAD's political work is um, attending to and focusing on urban indigenous subjectivities and the capacity for urban indigenous people to be revolutionary political actors as well. So what I hear from urban indigenous people who are involved in tent cities and in an organization is that it can be pretty complicated to find yourself always on indigenous territory, but not necessarily your own territory and not quite know what the, how to navigate that in a way that doesn't just um, you know immediately for example defer to band councils which were created with the Indian Act so I think there's a lot of um, tension and contradiction um, when we talk about urban indigenous people and what their role as political actors can be if that makes sense can you give us a bit of background on the schoolhouse squat in Nanaimo? Yeah, totally. So um, deciding to squat an empty building uh, is kind of a culmination of what we've learned over the past 
two years organizing in tent cities. Um, so for the past two years, basically judges have said there's 100 people in this tent city. If you want to get an injunction to evict them, where are you going to put them? If you don't have housing, then it's um, unreasonable to do that. And we found in the past um, couple months that the courts are no longer, um, you know, no longer feeling like it's important for the state to take responsibility to house people. So in discontent in particular, um, the city got an injunction against the tent city and the judge approved it and said that it's reasonable to evict this tent city because tents are unsafe to live in because of fire safety issues. So our response to that, um, our legal response and the legal claim we were hoping to make with the schoolhouse squat is that if on the one hand courts have acknowledged that tent cities are important because they're sites of survival and safety and community, but on the other hand they're also saying that tents are unsafe to live in because they're fire hazards, then our response to that is, okay, well, we're going to take an empty building, which provides the community and the safety without the hazards of living in a tent, um, being exposed to the elements year-round. So uh, in terms of the legalistic side, that's the claim we were hoping to make um, and hoping to make in court. Um, and then tactically, you know, it's the, the squad is not so different from um, the tent cities. It's still, it was still an action that was intended to create immediate um, to support people's immediate survival needs um, while also uh, disrupting the property rights and framework around property that are at the roots of the housing crisis. Can you also um, tell us a bit about those tent cities and how they came to be? I guess both mm -hmm. the discontent city in Nanaimo, if you know about that, or the Maple Ridge one, if you were more involved in that one. Yeah. Um, so Discontent City, city um, started, it had roots in a tent city that started up as a kind of protest camp on Nanaimo City Hall lawn in, gosh, I think in April. So people in Nanaimo, homeless people, gathered together and were protesting. I can't really remember what it was, but they had two demands from city council. One was about releasing resources for homeless people, um, and then there was also, I think, a general uh, protesting of the housing crisis. So they set up that tent city in this ad hoc way, and it was uh, taken down by the police within a week. And um, AAD organizers heard about it, and we reached out to um, the people in Nanaimo who were involved and said, you know, if you're interested in starting a tent city that could last longer and um, be a stable source of support and safety for homeless people, we'd be happy to share our experiences with you. And they agreed, so um, we went over and helped prepare to start the tent city. So the, like, um, how to start a tent city that's not going to get displaced by the pigs immediately is pretty simple. You um, And it, it involves not only claiming sites and setting up tents, but also having a prepared political statement that you can release to the media, that you can call a um, press release and make a political claim to you know, squatting public land. So that's how it happened in discontent and is somewhat similar in Maple Ridge. There are a group of homeless people that had started a tent city a couple years ago called Cliff Avenue. AD was involved with that. Um, that tent city was shut down uh, with the promise that a shelter would be opened. So people went into the shelter and then a year and a half later, that shelter was closed and there was no alternative offered. So at that point, people decided, okay, we're going to start a tent city again. Um, because this is ridiculous. We have nowhere else to go. And similarly, AAD helped organize. We had a political statement ready. Um, and we had enough um, people mobilized so that when the cops did try to take it down, they were met with a show of force that they backed off of. And we were able to hold the site long enough to get into court and make a claim that displacing it would violate people's charter rights. So the like... Um, I'd say the reasons for tar starting tent cities are pretty similar across the board. It's to um, create sanctuary against bylaw and police harassment, as well as the harassment of local anti-homeless bigots who, especially outside of Vancouver, um, just make a point of physically attacking and harassing homeless people. So the, um, the reasoning is to create 
that kind of sanctuary. And then in order to hold tent cities, um, basically you've got to have a strong political argument that holds off the police long enough to get into court and make an argument about charter rights to a judge. Do you think that's still how you'd go about doing things now? Or do you think that things seem to have changed in the police or legal realm that would make that different? I think things have changed. Um, I mean, the courts, uh, I think, are responding to the normalization of homelessness and just taking it as a given that there are always going to be homeless people, which allows them to grant these injunctions because it assumes that cities can't do anything except offer, you know, municipal parks for people to camp in. So I think the court, the courts have kind of shifted in their attitude. I think at the same time, the BC NDP is coming down really hard and mobilizing the cops to crush any kind of um, organized homeless resistance, which we see in discontent and with the squat and also with Namigan's tent city, which was um, displaced from their original site in Saanich a couple weeks ago and then just chased around from site to site on police lockdown. Um, So I think what we've learned and what we're reflecting from is this um, the kind of tense relationship we have with the courts where realistically you have to make it into court in order to make a claim that homeless people are indeed persons and that they should be protected under the charter um, charter rights and freedoms but at the same time as soon as you move into court you're no longer um, you're no longer maneuvering from a political base it's like a legalistic base where the court has to break up the collectivity of the tent city and treat individuals as clients and this is what lawyers do as well so the way we're thinking about it now is um, how can we continue to build that power that allowed us to hold tent cities in the first place? Um, how can we use courts strategically, but never as like the central core of our tactics? And to me, the squat is kind of um, or is the response to this shifting political topography that continues to build upon that power and try to con- tries to consolidate it while always upping the ante. Because as soon as you stop pushing, whatever you're doing becomes normalized. So if we didn't, like, I think if we don't keep pushing forward, then the state's response to tent cities will just be to either immediately displace them or normalize them and turn them into open air shelters and have social workers manage people to um, politically neutralize um, the collectives that start them in the first place. Yeah, it it seemed to me that the um, one of the real sources of power in those tent cities was like the coming together of people for different reasons, probably and in different situations. But um, that kind of collective force is, I think, pretty powerful um, and definitely not something that the court wants to deal with or acknowledge or. Um, yeah, it seems like probably they're just opposed to that kind of power existing. Totally. And I think, like, there's, like, the hard power of the cops that comes down and tries to break people. But there's also the soft power of, like, you know, nonprofits and social workers and service providers who come in, treat individuals, try to connect them with resources, and are also, um, in a softer way, breaking up any kind of collective organized resistance that... Um, articulates the housing crisis as a as a systemic issue with roots in capitalism and colonization rather than you know a, a crisis that we can manage just by smoothing over some of the edges and making sure that the like some portions of um, society are shielded a little bit while leaving homeless people out mm-hmm. um, can you talk a bit about what the what that sort of soft power approach that the state um, has been using looks like or the kind of solutions that they have been proposing? Um, So I think the best demonstration of what that kind of soft power looks like and how it both neutralizes political dissent and um, kills people is super intensity, which started in Victoria um, and lasted for 
definitely over a year. I think it was something like 14 months. So in the 14 months that Superintendent City was set up on um, the Victoria Court lawn, I think one person died of an OD. And in order to displace the tent city, um, Victoria opened up supportive housing and said, oh, well, you can all now move into this supportive housing. The province is releasing some funds. And they partnered with PHS, which is a supportive housing nonprofit, to open this housing. Um, And as people moved in, they were promised that they would have full rights under the Residential Tenancy Act and that it wouldn't be, you know, this um, basically prison where people would be surveilled. Of course, none of that um, followed through. So in the first year of moving into this supportive housing complex, the residents of Superintendent City lost on average one person a month. So one person a month has died in supportive housing since it opened, whereas with the tent city, they only lost one person or maybe two people in about 14 months. Um, So in terms of like harm reduction, these isolating units, lead to people's deaths. And in addition to that, PHS took away people's Residential Tenancy Act rights, didn't respect them. They installed cameras in the hallways. They closed down common areas. They imposed curfews. They turned away guests that didn't have government IDs. And when people fought back and, you know, smashed cameras because they didn't want to be surveilled in their own homes, they were charged with criminal, um, they they were given criminal charges and PHS staff you know, testified against them in court. They evicted people who were clearly uh, the political leaders who were organizing and pushing back against um, the carceral aspects of housing. And that, like, that lesson, I think, is super important. And people from Superintent actually went up to Discontent City and were like, you should hear our story of what happened when we agreed to go into supportive housing because the nonprofit... Um, PHS that was running that housing has started kind of sending workers over to discontent, you know, doing barbecues and cozying up with people because they want another contract and they want that contract in Nanaimo. So it's actually like, I think a lot of people hear supportive housing and supportive sounds nice. So they think it's a good thing. Like how could a nonprofit be as evil as the state? Um, But really these nonprofit service providers function to manage populations that are seen as, you know, not outside of the public or surplus to capital or dangerous. And they make sure that they stay atomized, isolated, surveilled, criminalized, and unable to organize, um, to, you know, agitate for their best interests. And I think like, like in British Columbia, when the province talks about housing, They're not talking about social housing. They're only talking about supportive housing. Like non-supportive housing for low-income people, people on welfare, on disability is not even on the table. So, and I think that's also a big context is when we started up the tent cities, they were sites that, you know, um, addressed immediate survival needs and allowed people to agitate for housing. And so when we first started them, we kept on saying, this is how many units of social housing we need right now. This is how many units of social housing we need every year to end homelessness in BC. And it got to a point where we started to feel like it was just kind of empty rhetoric because they're nowhere near providing social housing. They're only offering supportive housing. So the squat is also responding to that total the total absence of interest on the state's part to actually provide dignified housing that won't just kill people and criminalize and surveil them so it's truly like i think like speaking to the discontent city residents who were at the forefront of wanting to start the squat like there's this deep sense that there's literally no other options out there so what can you do when there's when there's no options well you're going to take what you need yourself because the government is not interested in offering it at all. In terms of the provincial NDP, um, are there specific things that they've been doing that have been escalating the housing crisis or intensifying the repression against homeless people? Yeah, so the um, Nomegan's tent city, which was in Saanich, um, they were first located on land that was mostly municipal, um, but also provincial. And the court injunction was approved. So um, a couple weeks ago, we moved from that site to a site 
that was owned by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. And the, um, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure issued an eviction notice and asked the police to displace the tent city, which they don't have to do, right? They can wait um, and apply for an injunction rather than just asking the police to evict people, um, but they bypassed that uh, legal route, even though we made it clear that um, that's what we would do if given the opportunity. So they bypassed the legal route and went straight for an injunction. People then moved to a provincial campground because they had nowhere else to go. And the NDP shut down the campground and um, enforced a 24-7 a police blockade of the gate and they didn't let anybody in except for social workers and people who lived there. So there are people who were trying to visit their family who were turned away. Um, there are indigenous people who were on their own territory who were turned away by the cops that the NDP told to blockade them. So I think this is all just last month. I think that really disproportionate um, deploying of the police to literally follow this group around and shut down their access to anybody outside of the people who are homeless, including organizers and supporters, um, is just extreme. And I think it shows that the NDP is not willing to tolerate any kind of organization from homeless people or agitation. And aside from that, their policies, again, are fixated on supportive housing. Um, David Eby has been big on the foreign investment myth, which is a racist explanation for the housing crisis that mobilizes BC and Canada's long history of anti-Chinese racism to, you know, blame Chinese foreigners for the current housing crisis. Um, so their policies don't do anything for homeless people and at best, you know, maybe mitigate some harder edges of the crisis for people who are um, already better off than those who are most vulnerable. And they're now recently just deploying the police against homeless people. So that's um, that's the story with the BC NDP. And I think the bigger issue is that because the NDP has all these union ties and they're, they kind of represent, again, this like nostalgic longing for the heyday of um, the welfare state that like progressives and leftists in BC have said little or nothing about the, the police attacks on homeless people because you know, they're in cahoots with the NDP and there's this myth that, you know, social democracy and electoral reforms are going to be adequate to address the housing crisis. I'm curious about uh, where you see this heading or how organizing against displacement is part of a broader revolutionary strategy. We do feel like we're in a place where we can create a dual power based on land relations rather than um, economic production. So that can take the form of tent cities and squats. It can also take the form of um, tenants who are being evicted, refusing to leave. And so we see homeless people like leading these revolutionary politics through tent cities and through the squat. But um, we also organize low income tenants who are you know, being rent evicted and dem evicted and evicted on a mass scale. And I think the hope is that those people will see the squad action and see what tent cities are able to do and see that people can build power that pushes back on displacement, but they have to do it collectively. And um, there has to be some kind of extra legal base because the courts can be useful, but they're never going to say, sure, you should just stop all evictions. Like we can't rely on the courts to do that. So I think looking ahead, we're thinking always about how to build that power and how to um, articulate a revolutionary politics that is both anti-colonial and anti-capitalist, because there's not a lot of good examples in history of what that looks like in practice. Um, and again, I think focusing on land relations is one way in which we can marry those politics and push them forward. In terms of a more specific next steps, um, we're talking about forming some kind of like tent city federation or a homeless people's federation across BC so that homeless leaders that are um, emerging in these different local sites of struggle can better connect across 
regions and, you know, maybe form, like we can help form the infrastructure for a broader movement of homeless people. Because right now a lot of, um, in all these different sites, people do rely on AAD to connect them with other tent cities and other sites of struggle. And it would be great if we could help create the infrastructure for homeless people um, to be doing that on their own with, with autonomy from AAD. Were there any final thoughts that you had or things that I haven't asked about that you wanted to say? Um, I mean, I didn't talk too much about like what it actually felt like inside the squad or what we did, but I think it, it's fine to have other people like tell that story. Um, the way we're, we were in there for, I guess, 17 hours. Um, and the way we are talking about it is, 17 hours of freedom because it felt really wonderful and the best the best components of tent city like the you know the collective spirit the like organized coordination the caring for each other like the self-governance all of that was present in the squat but accentuated because we're all indoors and there is lights and electricity and heat and so i think um I think all of us walked away from the squat feeling like the 17 hours we spent inside working together and making the place feel like a home, even in such a short period, feels like this really um, important window into how things could be and what like what revolutionary interventions can feel like on a you know embodied level. Steps from the 403. Unlock your eyes, unlock the lies. 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 Ask it, yo, it's for the people. 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 Can't kick it, they be kicking the can. No time for can't kick it when I'm spitting the red. I'm a hip hop savage and I spit it insane. Own lock, no lock. Breaking the chains from the res, yeah. Word of fraud, that's plain. I'm a lyrical chief, call me Fifth on Team. Steady speaking the wisdom, hip hop be the answer. And I keep the track spinning like a fancy dancer. When I drop, I drop, and when I stop, I stop. You can say that hip hop. What's up, what's up, girl? Representing West Coast, oh, yeah. Are you down to ride? Game true 
always spitting them hard knocks. Be tripping when they see we live in that spit shine. We get in the clubs, we be hitting with six sales. We fin to break down the deep boys and all of them ballers. Now who making dollars? As they just the greatest, there's no need to hit us. This hit list, we topping in hip hop. We popping, we pop, pop, and lock the dancers. We rocking. Niska in the channel of Clinkett and Haida Gwaii Man, who was born and raised in what we now call Vancouver, BC. Um, I'm actually a founding member of a, what became AAD. Um, I had met my comrade Ivan about eight years ago while he was organizing primarily in the downtown east side. And um, after a couple of years of that, we decided to uh, move outside of. Uh, strictly organizing in what we now call the downtown east side because we started to recognize that the homelessness crisis is most acute here, but it doesn't originate here in the downtown east side. So we started moving elsewhere, uh, namely Burnaby, Anita, uh, Maple Ridge, Victoria, and Nanaimo. I got into the housing issue when I myself was uh, threatened with um, a demo eviction while living in then. SRO about eight years ago. And uh, now I live in safe, secure, uh, rental protected housing, but um, I continue to um, work within the housing struggle because uh, I, I have a lot of friends and family that are homeless. And there's probably not a week that goes, that, probably not a week that goes by where I don't have someone asking to stay at my place for a night or two or coming over for some food. Um, so even though I'm not actually homeless myself, I'm still affected by it. And then I, I live in the downtown east side, so I see tents and tents and people sleeping in alleys like every single day, just just as as I try to go around trying to survive on my own. A lot of cops down here, and the city of Vancouver always cries poverty when we ask for funding for housing, but whenever the VPD asks for a the budget increase, um, there's there's none of that um, rhetoric about tightening your belt. and It's austerity for everybody except for cops, politicians, and prisons, and the army. So were you involved with the squat in Nanaimo? I had kind of decided to go at the last minute, um, um, but I, I did end up going because... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an indigenous man that's lived in the downtown east side for almost 10 years. Uh, I've been criminalized for the past, let's see, 20, 22 years or so. Um, so I decided to go because, uh, you know, I've been arrested before. I've been not been in the in the Canadian legal system before, and I knew it would be helpful to have someone who was just in there who was absolutely certain that they were doing the right thing, regardless of. Uh, how the arrests were gonna shake we're gonna shake out um not so much for the for the homeless um people that were in the squat because they deal with police and bylaw pretty much every day um but for some of the supporters and organizers who had never really been arrested, I thought having my presence there to just keep people calm and keep people focused on the bigger picture of, of what we're doing um would be helpful. Another reason I went for my own personal reasons, um, I just had, I've been embroiled in legal issues that I don't need to get into right now um, with the VPD for the past four years. And pretty much during that entire better part of four years, any kind of AAD um, event or action, I was always one of the very first questions I asked was, are there going to be pigs there? Um, and I just got tired of having that be a part of my calculus of, of whether I should take part in AAD actions or not. So a big part of the reason I went was I had realized that I had allowed the, the state to take away a lot of my power 
So part of it was just saying, I'm giving them too much power. I'm, I'm taking it back. For sure. Can you tell me a bit about what the squat was like or paint me a picture of what it was like to be there with people? Um, but a few of the people, uh, it was literally their first time inside, um, inside under a roof, um, probably in years that didn't, uh, um, I mean, I imagine they maybe had to stay in, in jail overnight in the, in the years in between, but, um, for, for some people to just sleep inside under a roof with 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 their friends, it was it it was a good thing for them. Um, I know there was like when when we first went into the building, the building was a mess. You could tell it was like, for lack of a better term, evacuated very very quickly. And um, there was just school supplies and chairs and tables chosen to be upstairs in in one of the rooms and. Um, as like we we kind of split up into teams. There were some people cleaning up what was going to be like our our living area, so to speak. Um, there were some people helping um, barricade the doors, and there were people uh, who decided to cook. We also had people posted as lookouts on the roof um, to see if, uh, in case there was any kind of late night police raid, which uh, obviously didn't happen because the arrest came at 10:30 the next morning. We're, we're just trying to establish a beachhead in hopes that we could occupy the place long enough to get other potential residents there. And then obviously, uh, we're only in there for 17 hours um, before we're all taken down. The different police forces and the different um, state forces had realized probably that it would be best to squash this right away. Because really, at the end of the day, the whole thing was just trying to challenge the kind of unspoken um, sanctity of, um, of um, like, land ownership within the context of BC. Could you expand on that a bit, I guess? Or, like, um, how do you see setting up squats or tent cities as trying to challenge those colonial property relations mm -hmm. or... Whenever a tent city takes takes over takes over space, organizers tend to try to pick uh, plots of land that ostensibly belong to the public um, when we can. But um, what we realize when when a tent city starts is um, this kind of arbitrary uh, wall between public and private property dissolves really really quickly when um, homeless people who are disproportionately Indigenous um, occupy that space. And then the, the plot of land in question, very, very quickly, uh, people who are against the actions that these communities are taking, um, very, very quickly, people start positioning themselves as, as tax-paying citizens, either homeowners or tax-paying citizens. And um, the implication there is um, if you don't own a home and like a detached home or or pay taxes, you have no right to essentially public land. One of the things that I feel that keeps getting dismissed, not just regarding homelessness, you know, I'm an indigenous man that lives in Vancouver. Uh, um, but my my families, uh, they come from like northern BC or on the island. Uh, is where my ancestry comes from, but uh, like my families, like my great my grandmother and my grandfather, they moved down here shortly after my parents were born, looking for better jobs, uh, better economic opportunities. And so I was kind of just like born in Vancouver by by accident, for lack of a better term. I like I certainly didn't choose to be, be born here. Well, no one really gets to choose where they're born, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, like, my two, like, there's a lot of indigenous, urban indigenous people in the city, um, often living relatively far away from their own home territory. Uh, but what, what I've noticed 
and what a few of the indigenous people um, in our group have noticed over the past few years is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people, particularly here around what we now call Vancouver and the urban centers in the city, who um, and this isn't to demean the work that they do, but they're they're like self-styled uh, land defenders defending their own territory, which is great. The work they're doing is great. But the way they frame themselves and the way they frame their struggle as like being only legitimate if you're defending like your home territory or some forest that's a, a part of your territory or some something near your, your own actual homeland as being the only way to like legitimately I mean they don't necessarily say this but it's it's implied in the way it's all it's usually framed as like the only legitimate way to claim your indigeneity is to basically go back home, learn some some of the language, learn some of some of your history and defend like your traditional homeland. That's um I, I get that sentiment. I do. At the same time though, it leaves out a huge amount of people. For example, there's probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who were taken up in the 60s scoop who have no connection to their home territory, who wouldn't even, who might not even necessarily know where their home territory is or what their nation is. Or even if they do, they don't necessarily have the, the connection to just up and move the urban centers and go back home. And they might not even be accepted when they get back home because the urban, uh, like the overall indigenous populations are growing but the uh, the reserves they're static at best they're shrinking because of uh, because of development of um, the extractive industries. So um, this is this is a question that needs to be examined by um, by the ever increasing growing urban indigenous population. Because you know I was born and raised here in what we now call Vancouver, and I do hate a lot of things about living in this area but I can't help but feel that this is home so the question is like it becomes like okay so what do I do as an urban indigenous person um how do I how do I challenge colonial authority without having to kind of essentialize myself and, and move back just to New Orleans or Gold River and just focus on Moachut and or Niska issues it's kind of different from what happened in the 60s with the Red Power Movement. The Red, the Red Power Movement in the 60s was largely urban indigenous people kind of reclaiming their, identi- uh, their indigenous identity. Um, and obviously being uh, um, inspired by the Black Power Movement. Um, but that was, that was a while ago, um, certainly before my time, but now the pendulum has kind of swung the other way where it's, um, where you kind of have to have these cultural signifiers to uh, legitimize your struggle, like having a, in my case, a Niskut name and or regalia and knowing the language and the songs as like the only way to legitimize yourself. In the 60s, it was a little bit different. It's like, well, I'm an Indian and I believe in red power. Therefore, my struggle is uh, legitimate. Um, so it's it's just two completely different eras. And um, there's strength in both. And there's parts of both ways of thinking that aren't necessarily strong. But like, how do we... As different communities, as different groups of people, how do we kind of take these kind of two strands of thought and not just those two strands of thought? I mean, colonial ways of being, it's like, it, it very much is, it's permeated me, you know? Um, so how do I take these kind of three strands of thought and kind of kind of like braid them together, weave them together to create something that, that, that doesn't necessarily eschew any of that, but, um, 
incorporate incorporate those into something that's um a brand new whole like a brand new way of being um how do we do that can we do that i don't know that's like the multi-billion dollar question <laughs> Definitely. you know and it's not just and it's not even just that I relate to a lot of the stuff you're saying because I, my family's indigenous to North Africa, but mm -hmm. my parents left and raised me in North America. And so I don't, I barely know my family. I don't speak the language. I can't like mm -hmm. have that authentic claim to like a land base really, or like uh, mm -hmm. that unbroken tradition. And mm -hmm. I still, like, I can see why so much of what colonization is about is breaking people's ties to that and isolating them, like, because I, I see how it's a real source of power and, and life for people. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I just don't have that. So yeah, mm -hmm. I find myself like here living under the Canadian state and like mm -hmm. that's for sure a different relationship than you have with like living in Vancouver but yeah the yeah. best like answer I found for like what to do is like try to find other people who also mm -hmm. want to want that particular yeah. state relationship to not exist. One thing that was really apparent with this action that we took is we crossed this really arbitrary and imaginary kind of like liberal line where occupying an empty lot is fine when actually no it wasn't fine we got a lot of racist backlash and feedback for taking over or for starting 10 cities um in a way 10 cities have kind of been victims of their own success in that in vancouver there's kind of a an unofficial tent city at Oppenheimer Park right now. Um, but it's not organized, so it's just ignored by the city. And tent cities have been going on here for about 15 years in Vancouver. So they're somewhat normalized. Um, but the other side of our kind of quote-unquote success with tent cities is um, the powers that be freaking out and just creating an open-air prison. Um, those are kind of the two kind of the two ways that the success of a tent city can go either it's complete normalization or a complete ratcheting it up of moral panic and and discourse around safety and, and basically creating a, an open air prison there's kind of no in between um but tent cities aren't aren't like a long term strategy they were they were a tactic of survival and as the moral panic and outrage and all of that happened around the Megans and discontent city and the repression increased, it became pretty apparent that um, tent cities as, as a tactic were kind of reaching kind of the end of their rope for, for now. Um, so the next kind of logical step in this this escalation is like okay so you don't want 10 cities well we taken over an abandoned building you're listening to from embers a regular podcast about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice throughout so-called canada check us out at from embers.libsyn.com we had a press conference on saturday or the Sunday afterwards to try to deal with some of the misconceptions that were getting out getting out there it was it was somewhat successfully derailed by um by homeless haters. Um but after after the press conference, this guy who I bet you if he grilled him he would totally say he's not racist. But he came up to me after the press conference, he looked at my two hundred dollar boots and he said, Those are nice boots. Did you buy them or did you steal them? And then he demanded to see 
a receipt for my boots. Because I guess that's a thing that people do. They just carry around receipts for all the clothes that they're wearing. Yeah. Um, and then when asked where where's the bill of receipt for like the nation state, it's like, well, now I'm just talking about crazy native issues that has nothing to do with objective reality. And I'm the real racist for for bringing up native issues in the first place. So it's just this bizarre ill logic that that just goes through people's minds. But this act, it wasn't about changing the minds of 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 like individual bigots. I mean, that's not going to happen over a over a discussion or over. Well, it's unlikely to happen in a prolonged sit down discussion. Never mind when tempers are flaring and people are grabbing literal megaphones and screaming at each other. It was about trying to. It was a natural response to the court saying, okay, so you basically legislated homelessness people out of everywhere that we could conceivably be. So we're we're gonna we're gonna match our tactics to yours. It's like, okay, so if we can't have a tent city, we're gonna try to take a building and try try make a legal case that while well, so long as the government is, is not doing anything regarding building um affordable housing to people on sink stickums, then the homeless community should have should be able to squat empty buildings. And the this like I, I mentioned earlier that we crossed this like very arbitrary, like liberal line that our tactics went too far. Like I've been doing this for almost ten years. I have sat in city council meetings. I have talked to the mayor. I was co chair of the downtown east side local area planning process about five or six years ago. I have tried sitting with policymakers. Um, I've tried to appeal to the humanity of um decision makers and power brokers. But I realize that um I'm never gonna get my humanity bit back by nicely asking it from the very people that took it in the first place. The only way to get it back is to fight for it back. After the fact, sure, whoever get, whoever the government is of the day will say they gave it back. But in reality, what what happens with these struggles is people fight for the changes that we need to make. Are there things that people can do to support you? Well, one thing that happened in Nanaimo was there was a a significant chunk of the population and significant chunks of the state apparatus um, that very, very clearly sided against um, the idea that homeless people have a right to exist. Um, But that certainly can't be... I certainly don't think that everybody has sided against us. but if there was ever a if there was ever a time to quote unquote uh, for lack of a better term uh, two sides right now uh, the the size of the the side of the status quo or the side of the people that are trying to challenge that status quo um, if there was ever a time to stop fence sitting this is it because part of because the day of the rest that was a huge exercise with theatricality if you I mean why else would uh, the RCMP show up in fully militarized gear with assault rifles and and balaclavas and have other members of municipal police uh, show up with riot riot gear and shields. It was all for show. Like, why why would they need all that military equipment to take what ended up being 23 people sitting in a circle on the roof? If we can get past some of our knee-jerk reactions of, of the absolute morality of the law, of the absolute righteousness of the Canadian nation state. Um, and actually look at these issues. If we can, as communities of communities, really look at this and fight to make change, we can do it. It's just, you know, fortune, fortune favors the bold. So why not be bold, you know? And... Yeah, why not be bold? (laughs) 
Join us for Kite Line, a weekly radio program on Channel Zero Network that focuses on issues in the prison system. With over 50 episodes already released, you can hear informative and riveting stories about the impact of prisons on people both inside and outside of the prison walls and how they fight back. Kite Line is intended as means of communication between people across prison walls. Our goal at Kite Line is to amplify the voices of those within the prison system while encouraging dialogue with those on the outside. Hear us on the Channel Zero network and visit our website for more information or previous episodes at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. My name is Amber McGrath. Uh, I um, am an organizer uh, and I guess spokesperson as well uh, for discontent city in Nanaimo, BC. What made you decide to get involved with um, discontent city? Basically, uh, the city of Nanaimo is the only city in Canada uh, that uh, basically turned down uh, seven, just over $7 million uh, to build a 44-unit um, supportive housing. Basically, what had happened is, is that a bunch of people from that community uh, decided that you can't put, uh, you know, homeless people or, or you know, people that... Um, you know, may have addiction issues or mental health issues anywhere near um, a school or uh, people. And so, (laughs) you know, seniors live there. There's children in that neighborhood. There's people in that neighborhood. And so city council uh, voted no to put it in. Um, They didn't have any other locations picked. And uh, so the province said, okay, well, you lost it. So in March, uh, we did a protest, um, and we put a bunch of... uh, a bunch of homeless people uh, set up camp on the on the lawn and and demanded demanded that um, you know city council start doing doing their job basically um, uh, and so you know uh, they had discussed about uh, creating a drop in center um, you know with resources and you know a place that homeless people could go during the day um, once you know if you stay in the shelter you're kicked out at you know seven or eight in the morning and essentially you have nowhere to go. We were they were supposed to put in porta potties downtown so that people had places to go to the washroom. Um, you know, there's going to be more needle boxes around so that um, you know there weren't needles discarded and uh, you know a, a few other things. And um, they made us a bunch of promises. And then uh, we were there for ten days, and um, you know they asked us to leave, and they still haven't followed through with any of them. And so we started uh, Discontent City in May. Can you tell me a bit about what Discontent City was like? First off, we always laugh. Um, it was uh, bizarre how easy it went down when we actually did it. That it's, you know, now not surprising that we're having such a hard time. <laughs> it was a little too easy. Like, it went really smoothly. Like, um, you know, we held a press conference. And uh, basically, while a couple of people were talking to media, um, there, 20 of us grabbed tents and basically crossed the street while six RCMP watched us and uh, basically walked onto the site and uh, uh, set up our tents and made a camp. And within the first, you know, 24 hours, uh, the camp went from like 20 people to uh, 50. And within the first, like, week, we had 75, and then there was 100 the next week, and then there was 150. And now we're up at, uh, I think the last count, last week there was, like, 260 tents or 250 tents and 300-plus people living there. Like, every time you see the site, it, it's breathtaking. Like, oh, wow. Oh, my God. Like, there, there are RVs there. There's cars. There's buses. There's tents everywhere there's people everywhere it's just it's insane how many people are there like to see them all um you know and the fact that they're all living there and you know i mean of course there's been fights and there's been you know uh, you know some situations there will say but to have that many people congregated on one site and not kill each other because essentially they're all roommates right <laughs> like they're you know doing pretty well I would say, you know, I mean, you know, all surviving together, right? Because that's basically what they're doing is surviving down there, so. 
are there things about that that are positive for people or more positive for people than other options that they might currently have? Or are there like also challenges that they might face? There's pros and cons. I mean, I think that the pros um, that, you know, a lot of people don't hear about, um, you know, <clears throat> there was um, like, I don't know what other cities are like. I mean, it's happening everywhere, but um, with Nanaimo, uh, you know, there was homeless people in the parks that were being sprayed with uh, super soaker filled with bleach and they were having their shoes stolen or they would have their belongings taken or they would get beat up in the park by just some random, you know, vigilante, we'll call them, right? Um, we had female uh, female uh, homeless women come that were, that had, you know, such bad trauma and such bad PTSD that they were shaking. This one woman, I'll never forget her. She was crying. She was shaking. She was terrified to come. And I, I know, and one of the male residents was like, hey, can I help you? Like, what's the end? She just recoiled from this man. And I said, let me handle, let me go talk to her. I'll find out what's going on. So I went and talked to her. And it took her, she had to leave and come back three times. And so finally when she she asked to speak to me and, and she was raped in the park, not by a homeless person, but by a random citizen. Mm -hmm. And she reached out to the police and they didn't do anything about it. And so she was afraid. And then she heard about the camp. And so she came to the camp. She was afraid to come to the camp because there were so many people. And, you know, and I said, I'm, you know, I promise you, if you scream, somebody will be here. Somebody will help you. Somebody is here. Somebody, you know, we all need to take care of each other. And mm -hmm. so she came in. And, you know, little bit by bit, you know, as time went on, you saw her come out of her tent. And her head lifted. And, you know, she would look you in the eye. And she wasn't staring at the ground anymore. And, and, you know, and there were other people like that. You know, once you get, a, you know, a full night's sleep and you're not worrying about being moved around in the middle of the night or having your belongings stolen, you get to rest. And so, you know, um, getting a good rest, a good night's sleep is really important to your health, not only your physical health, but your emotional health, your mental health, right? And so they started to get confident, these people, right? Like they're feeling better. They're feeling better about themselves. They're feeling a little more stable. And so to see that was really, really cool to see people um, take care of each other like somebody did overdose when I was there. And, you know, to hear people yell, uh, you know, Narcan, and like six people went running and, you know, they all helped that first an ambulance came. And, you know, um, usually they don't call the ambulance. They, you know, they're afraid to call the ambulance, but now they were in a stable situation where they could call the ambulance, which is great, right? So, um, yeah, there was a lot of pros, and there's a lot of cons. I mean, you know, um, when you're living on the streets, you know, one of the ways of surviving and coping is, is to use drugs, and so there are people that are using drugs, and unfortunately with drugs comes theft, um, and so, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand. Um, Unfortunately, Nanaimo has a lot of drugs and a lot of crime, a lot of theft. And so when the camp, uh, you know, got bigger, um, you know, a lot of that stuff was concentrated to the one area, which really sucks. But again, it would have been happening anyway. It just wouldn't have all happened in one area, right? Did people have a sense of like, or were people in the camp sort of strategizing about how to deal with the cops specifically or keep each other safe in that respect yeah so like when the police come when the, like you know when we first set up the camp when the police would come and believe me they came um i'm a house supporter right like i have a home mm -hmm. but i stayed down there because you know i wanted to stay with them in solidarity and 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 be part of the protest the first night i had to leave mm -hmm. in the middle of the night two o'clock in the morning everyone was sleeping except for uh the person on the gate you know, and they were like, oh, we're doing a walkthrough. But why? Like, why Why do you need to be here? Everyone's asleep. You know, and, and they were just like, get out of the way and just came into the camp. And so, you know, I heard, Kevin, Kevin, wake up. And Kevin was like, leave me alone. I'm sleeping, man. Kevin, the cops are here. And we all, you know, all of a sudden we all sat up in our tents. We're like, what the fuck's going on? Like, why are the cops here? And then, boom, there was a light in my face. And it was scary. Um, and so after that night, that's it. And so whenever the police showed up, we had one person that was voted on a council. They were the RCMP liaison, and they were to go and speak to them, like, and not to prevent them from doing their jobs, but, like, stop them at the gate. What do you need? Like, how can we help you? You're like, do you need to be going through the, 
the camp right now, you know, because people do have PTSD from dealing with um, the RCMP, especially the homeless community, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're not treated as human beings. So to alleviate some of that trauma, you know, we would have somebody deal with RCMP, right? And so how can we help you? Are you looking for somebody specific? What's going on? Like, what do you need? How can we make your your visit here quicker and, you know, as, uh, you know, as efficient as possible and get you out of here, right, kind of thing. Yeah. And so, you know, um, a lot of the, the people that um, volunteered to do the RCMP liaison job, you know, um, you know, they were empowered, right, to stand up for themselves and go, no, like, you're not just going to walk in here and walk all over us and push us around. Why are you here? Like, what's your reason, right? And I remember the one RCMP officer saying, well, oh, oh, so we can't come here when we want to? And we were like, no, you can't. Oh, so we only come here when you call us. Uh, Yeah, isn't that what everybody does? How did people in Nanaimo respond to Discontent City? Well, let's start out on a good note. There was a lot of support, which was really great, Um, you know, from some citizens of of Nanaimo, a part of our community, right? Like uh, food donations and tent donations and and cash donations and, you know, just um, honking their horns of support or or coming down and talking to people, right? And um, getting to know the people that were living in the camp, the residents, and, you know, just treating them like human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other side of it was, you know, day one, People driving by, slamming on their horns, screaming, get a job, calling people a bunch of junkies. We had a guy yell, enjoy the uh, Molotov cocktail later. Um, there were, you know, the stuff on Facebook is just insane. There's Facebook groups up again, you know, made against the camp. Um, people joined uh, together on the roof of the mall, which is across the street at the top of the parkade, and would watch like it was a reality show. And people flew to, uh uh, flew those drones, those camera. They flew them into the camp. Like one was like ten feet above my head, filming me, and it was creepy. Like it's really gross. And you know, um, the the more the the longer the camp went on and the bigger that it got, the more people would congregate on the roof and just watch. And literally, it was like a sick television show. Like with the Facebook. Like I get death threats. I get three or four death threats a week. I had a man drive up. I was walking home from work, and he drove up uh, very slowly. I thought he was going to ask me for directions, and so I stepped close to his car and said, how can I help you? And he said, "Uh, you're that fat bitch that's running the camp. Uh, Put the junkies in your own backyard, and then, like, hocked a loogie in my face, Mm -hmm. and then drove off, calling me a stupid G next Tuesday. I've had beer bottles thrown at me, um... I get yelled at all the time. I get called a junkie lover. I get told to go die with my junkie friends. Um, every time I'm on the news, it gets worse. It's really sad um, to see that our community is just, a, well, not the whole community, but, you know, a, a good number of them are just so filled with hate. Um, and now we have, like, uh, the soldiers of Odin have gotten involved, uh, which are like a white nationalist, uh, white supremacist neo-Nazi bullshit group, excuse my language. And, um, you know, the leader of the the Vancouver Island chapter is running for city council right now. I can't even wrap my head around the fact that this man is allowed to run. And he's, like, endorses violence towards women all the time, like myself. He actually has been asking my friends what my address is so he can find me. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, wow, you're a tough guy. Okay. So, yeah, it's just, it's that's the kind of stuff that we've been dealing with. I have to cab everywhere. Um, I'm not allowed to leave my house alone. And I now don't even really go out. I'm a promoter and I work in the music industry and I don't even really go to shows now because every time I, I go out, I end up either having a panic attack because somebody has, you know, come up behind me and just patted me on the back and been like, hey, and I'm like, you know, it freaks me out. Um, or, you know, I end up in an argument with somebody, right? Yeah, it's been uh, it's it's been really eye-opening. Like, I didn't realize how bigoted and ignorant are a lot of people in our community are. That's pretty brutal. Is Discontent City currently facing the threat of eviction? So the city won an injunction 
uh, to basically to, uh, you know, get us out. So on October 12th, uh, you know, everyone was supposed to be out. But of course, uh, the weekend before, on the 5th, uh, the Minister uh, of Housing, uh, BC Housing, I guess, she uh, made an announcement that um, basically the city of Nanaimo uh, was going to put up 70, 70 shelters, shelter beds. And then the, uh, the province bought a chunk of land, and they're going to put up um, these ATCO construction trailer um, shelters. So it's like a temporary shelter situation. So basically we got 170 um, shelter spots, plus um, the province is going to do 40 to 50 uh, rental subsidies. Um, so that, um, like for, you know, regular housing market. And so um, so that's really awesome, right? Like we got all these shelter spots. But um, basically if the judge had known that these spots were going to come in, uh, I think he would have made the injunction for when the housing was ready. So the city of Nanaimo, we fought them this week. They, uh, we basically, our lawyer went to court and filed to get, uh, uh, what's the word, a variance on the injunction, I guess, um, basically to get the city to wait um, until the housing comes, right? Because we can't put 300 plus people back into the parks and on the street. And then how are you going to find them? to um, get them the support they need to get back into that housing lane. So um, basically the city uh, has decided to wait until next Friday um, to make uh, the decision to um, make the decision to um, enforce the order and get everybody out, right? Um, we're going to wait and they're going to wait to see what the judge has to say. So which, and I think the judge is going to say wait until um, the housing is ready, right? Because like I said, if you displace all those people, how are they going to get their supports? It's not like you can go to their house and say, hey, hi, your house is ready for you, or, you know, call them on the phone if they don't have a phone. So, yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted to mention or any stories you wanted to share? I just I just think that, um, you know, it's... I think that the, the, you know, the people down at that camp, the residents right now, I'm, I'm just so proud of them. And I think that they need to be proud of themselves because whether, you know, and they can't really see it yet, which is really sad because the housing's not here. But through being, like, living in that site, um, you know, and doing the protest, they got 170 shelter spots. And that's more than any other city in D.C. So they they did something really good. You know, and, and I know that, like, there's a lot of negativity and, and you know, stuff that sort of surrounds, like, oh, they're, they're all criminals, they're all thieves, they're all junkies, they're all this. But they also have a political voice, right? And so, they and they used it. And I think it's just, it's super cool, right? Like, I'm just really proud of them. I think that's really awesome. And I and I hope that they realize that they they did something really good for their community. I, I you know, I hope they get to see that, right, and see the uh, positive uh, change that's going to come. As always, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at fromembers at riseup.net. Thanks for listening.